This is my TRS-80 Model 2, and I'm particularly nostalgic about this machine because it's the first machine that I had a paid programming gig for on compiler basic of all things. So I have an affinity for this machine. This is not my original machine by far. I wasn't able to, to keep my machine for that many decades, but was able to find one with a working keyboard. And that's actually a thing for these machines because these Keytronic keyboards ended up having significant problems with the foam pads. They, they tend to dry rot and, and crumble. But it got me thinking, could I possibly build a USB keyboard interface for this machine? So I've started looking through the technical reference manual, and I think there might be a way to do this. But I've got to start by taking the cover off of this machine and getting access to the keyboard interface. We'll start with removing the keyboard, which unplugs from the back of the keyboard unit, and then tucking away the wire back up inside the machine. On the back of the machine, there's the two screws that are holding on the lid, and these are quickly taken care of with a Phillips screwdriver. And with those two screws removed, and a little pressure on the sides, the top pops right off. Now this is the point where I have to pause the video and talk about the safe work area versus practically every other area of this computer. The disk drive in this machine runs on mains AC voltage and includes a large start capacitor. And to the right of our work area is a very open power supply and CRT circuitry. So if you're not 120% confident in terms of dealing with high voltage circuitry, that's perfectly okay. Because by the end of this series, my intent is that I'm gonna have something that plugs into the keyboard DIN connector. And there'll be no need to remove the lid off of this machine. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the journey. We're gonna start by reading the manual. And in this case, it's the technical reference manual section five, video keyboard interface. And this section provides all of the details needed to understand how the TRS-80 Model 2 keyboard interface works. And it also contains a detailed schematic and the pinouts that we're going to leverage to build our own interface. Now in my Model 2, the keyboard video interface card was on the far left. And you'll know it's this card because it has the six pin connector that's hooked up to the cable that carries through to the DIN connector for the keyboard. And in order to get better access, I'm going to need to remove the ribbon cable for the printer and the floppy disk controller cable. And now we can gently remove the keyboard connector. And we can now see the five lines that correspond to the pinout in the technical reference manual. And pin two is just a key to prevent the connector from being connected the wrong way. So now that I have easy access, I'm gonna hook up my oscilloscope leads to the data and the clock pins. Before I connect the probe ground leads, I just wanna confirm that there's continuity between the ground pin on the card and the screw I'll use to ground the leads. Next, I'll put the keyboard connector back over the pins, and this is so I can push through some keyboard signals and see what comes out on the oscilloscope. I have to reconnect the floppy so that we can actually boot the system. Now, I don't have to reconnect the printer cable, but it's just a habit of mine to put everything back the way it was before I boot it up. And finally, it's time to reconnect the power and fingers crossed for no smoke. All right, for the moment of truth, I'm just gonna switch over to the keyboard here. Hopefully you can hear me over the noise of this uh, Model 2. I'm gonna press the A key and voila, the signals are showing through. We have our clock signal on the bottom and we have our keyboard signal for that character, the letter A on the top, complete with our little notch on the right hand side. And we'll do a B and C and so on. And it's looking great. Like any other computer, the Model 2 is normally connected directly to its keyboard. Now to make it convenient for us to be able to intercept these lines, 
I'm going to first run the line to the breadboard and then from the breadboard back to the Model 2. And this will allow us to piggyback those signals to the Arduino. All right, so we're going to start it up and uh, see how it goes. Excellent. So far, so good. And now the moment of truth. How many drives? One. Excellent. All right, this is great. So our intercept is not interfering at all with the keyboard by the looks of it. So we have full functionality. I don't think I'm gonna bother. I think if there was something truly wrong with that data line, it, any character we hit is going to be messed up. So this is working perfectly and I'll shut it down now. And now we can actually start working on our input test signals. On the Arduino, or the Elegoo knockoff, I'm going to use pins 2 and 3 for the clock and data, and then hook those lines up to the oscilloscope so we can see what's going on. I'm going to start by trying to first emulate the clock signal. And this should be relatively straightforward since we're just creating a square wave. And at this point, I'm just plugging in a delay. I'm, I'm not picking anything specifically, just something so I can initially see the waveform being generated properly. So while this first waveform generated properly, I think I need to increase the delay just to extend out the square wave and make it more reminiscent of what we saw from the keyboard signals on the Model 2. Now that I have a decent square wave for the clock, I'm going to work on the data signal next. And for this, I'm going to use the bit read function, which basically just pulls a singular bit from a variable using i as an index. Now this next part was tricky for me because I had to basically offset the data stream from the clock stream so that the alignment was correct between the rising and falling edges of those respective signals. And it helps if I actually define the character, which in this case is 65 for the letter A. So the good news at this point is that we're seeing some semblance of a signal that we're looking for, but not quite the right one. So I added a delay at the end of the code just to represent a pulse of these signals coming through. And upon doing that, the signal is starting to look really good. And I went through a few more rounds of just incrementing the character value, uh, really just to ensure that we were getting the proper signals coming through for every character. Now, in order for the Model 2 to latch the value that we're sending through, we need to add an end of data pulse as the last step to our signal that we're sending through. And with that, I think we have a signal that's ready to test out on the Model 2. We're resetting the machine. Okay, now the machine is booting up. And before I send any characters to it, I'll just use the keyboard this one time to select the number of drives. And then I'm going to unplug the keyboard. And that is just to ensure that we don't get any interference from the keyboard circuitry 
when we're sending the signals across. Hooking up the ground line. So we have our clock line, which is two. And we have our data line, if I can get there. And then finally, we can see that we're starting to see some strange characters coming across on there. And I'm going to apply some power through. And wow, voila, look at that. We are getting the letter A, as predicted. Hmm. Well, we've got a bit of a little bit of a glitch there, but that could be anything. That could be some interference. That could be um, my code being a little bit uh, loosey goosey in terms of the timing of the cycles. But this is pretty impressive. I'm really happy with this. So I think uh, I'll try just changing up some of the characters. Uh, maybe start to try to send the letter B through just to see if uh, this isn't a fluke. Uh, I noticed as well that it gets to end of line on the Model 2, and I recall that, that the only way you can um, move to the next line is you need a, we'll need like a carriage return line feed. So you know what, I'm gonna try to feed that through, and that's character 13. So I'm gonna go ahead and change the character to 13, and re-upload that to the Arduino, and look at that. It is sending through. Now I'm going to quickly change that to the character 66. And I am amazed that that is actually working. Again, there's a little glitch in there, but that is way better than I was expecting. After a little more research, I found the shift out function, and I wish I'd found it earlier. This function shifts out a byte one bit at a time with the corresponding clock pulse. And their code sample is for writing to a shift register, which is exactly how the Model 2 decodes the serial data from the keyboard. My final tweak was to only send a character when the computer's busy signal is high. The code is now much cleaner and ready for testing. While the new code really improved the number of errors in the signals, I'm still seeing a few of them popping up and I'll, I'll have to figure this part out. Now I think that some of this may be due to the length of wires between the Model 2 and the Arduino and possibly some interference that's occurring. So my last step was to get rid of those longer lines and move the Arduino as close as possible to the computer. So now, we don't see any odd characters being injected, which is fantastic. There's only the occasional double characters, which is almost like keyboard bounce we'd see in mechanical keyboards. Although I'm getting this minor keyboard bounce issue, it's not really an issue. It's not the same as with mechanical keyboards where there used to be that effect. This is really caused by me pushing through a stream of characters at such a high rate of speed. And when I push characters one at a time or two at a time, it keeps up just fine. We don't have the bounce issue occurring. The next steps would now be to have a USB keyboard hooked up to the Arduino and sending signals to that. And then finally having the Arduino acting as a translator between the USB keyboard and the Model 2. I think this is a good jumping off opportunity for part one. And I'm going to start doing some research in terms of how to hook up USB devices to the Arduino. So looking forward to any comments from anyone who's done anything in regards to USB keyboard interfaces with Arduinos in the past would be greatly appreciated. And I'm looking forward to seeing everyone in the next video.